Under normal conditions, Dave Jackson, Parks Director for the Camden Public Library, leads historic walking tours on Fridays in the summer along with library trustee Amy Rollins. We may not be able to do that this year, so we are creating this virtual historic walking tour. The two people with one vision featured in this slide are Mary Louise Curtis Bach, daughter of H.K. Cyrus Curtis, founder of the Curtis Publishing Company, publishers of the Saturday Evening Post and Ladies Home Journal, and Fletcher Steele, a relatively unknown landscape architect discovered by Mrs. Bach, who today is renowned for his early experimentation with French modernism. Our National Historic Landmark plaque contains more detail than any other plaque we have ever seen. The National Park Service really captured the essence of the amphitheater. Some people in town remember her as a very distinguished lady who always wore gloves and was driven around by a chauffeur. The hanging baskets on Camden Street light poles still exist. In the summer, they are planted with ivy geraniums and in the winter, decorated with Christmas lights. Cyrus H.K. Curtis founded the Curtis Publishing Company best known for the Saturday Evening Post. Lindenwood is currently for sale. Mr. Curtis commissioned Cyrus Porter Brown to build this vacation residence in 1902. Brown is famous for his interpretation of the shingle style home that was popular at the time for its use of local and natural materials in a minimalist approach. The estate has remained in the Bach family until the present day. The 1958 Camden Town Report was dedicated to Mary Louise Curtis Bach. Here is her thank you letter for that honor. Ocean House Hotel was situated on a hill on the site of the present library. It burned down in 1903. Mary Louise Curtis Bach gave the land to the town, but she expected the people to raise the funds to build the library, which they did in the 10 years following the war. An inscription on the front steps of the new library reads, erected by the united effort and generosity of the community. Parker Morse Hooper, a summer resident, was the architect. He did the work pro bono. Before he finished, he was called away to become the editor of Architectural Record. Charles Loring took over. The library celebrated its 90th birthday in June of 2018. The original site was a rather steep hill. Fill was brought in and the south wall was erected to provide a level terrace for the library. The site of the amphitheater was a vacant lot next to the library grounds. The only feature retained was the elm tree in the foreground, which succumbed to Dutch elm disease later. Fletcher Steele worked in the office of Charles Loring, the number two library architect. It was Loring who suggested Steele as the designer of the amphitheater. It was a somewhat risky choice as he was essentially unknown. Fletcher Steele went to Harvard to study landscape architecture. He apprenticed with Warren Manning, who designed the McGuntacook Country Club and Aldemere Farm. With Manning, he developed an appreciation for natural landscapes. 
In 1925, he traveled to Europe and attended the Paris Exposition of Decorative and Industrial Arts. There, Steele became interested in the radical modernism of his European peers. From Paris, he went to Sicily to visit the ruins of Taormina, an ancient Greek amphitheater. That also influenced his design of the amphitheater. His work for Mrs. Mabel Choate at the Nomkeg estate, particularly the blue steps of the late 1930s, is today considered the iconic expression of modernism in his work. Here's a familiar view of the amphitheater. The theme for the amphitheater nomination, expressing cultural values and architecture, landscape architecture and urban design. In 1916, Mrs. Bach purchased the site where the Ocean View Hotel had burned to the ground and gave it to the town for a library site. The townspeople were expected to raise the funds for the library. It was 1928 before the library was completed. Providing work for local men at the beginning of the Great Depression was clearly one of Mary Bach's objectives. Most of the work was accomplished using simple tools and horsepower. Local boulders and full-sized trees were brought into the site on horse-drawn carts. Steele found the back of the library building uninspiring with only the high, thin windows of a stack room to look upon. Steele transformed this space by adding a double staircase that is a miniaturized version of the grand stairway at the Chateau Fontainebleau outside Paris. The stairway leads down to the Fawns Garden, featuring a bronze statue entitled Two Little Fawns, sculpted by Benjamin Kurtz and cast by the Roman foundry. A fountain at the base of the statue directs a stream of water to a pool below. The stone-edged turf is broken occasionally by individual plantings of mature birch or oak grouped with boulders that break the line of angular cut stones. Steele's use of white birch and dark evergreens is abstract and symbolic. Scholars have described this quality as proto-modern, recognizing it as one of Steele's early experiments with modernistic principles. The most radical departure from traditional form was Steele's highly celebrated use of the bent axis. The 1931 record plan clearly show the discordant angles joining the central axis from the library with the south-facing axis of the amphitheater. In a masterful tour de force, Steele broke the axis of the central stairway as it reached the floor of the amphitheater by rotating the U-shaped theater so that it faced out toward the Camden Harbor and the headlands beyond. Two pavilions frame the view and mark the bounds of the stage using the distant view as a backdrop. Steele likened the view to the painted opera house stage curtains popular at the time. Looking down from the Fawns Garden Terrace and Compass of the Winds, a central axial stairway descends into the five-tiered U-shaped bowl to an open lawn, a space that doubles as a stage and audience seating depending on the event being performed. This Camperdown elm is one of the few non-native species selected by Steele and a remnant of the original 1931 planting. It continues to thrive today. In 1996, a much needed addition to the library was built below the South Lawn. The project was designed to have minimal impact on the amphitheater. The lawn was subsequently restored and the retaining wall along Atlantic Avenue was rebuilt. The only major change was the creation of a below-ground entrance and reading plaza seen here. 
In 1997, a phased restoration plan was introduced to preserve the library grounds, amphitheater, and nearby Harbor Park, which included replacement of lost plant materials throughout the property, as well as the recent restoration of the Fawns Garden. The amphitheater has enriched the lives of residents and visitors since it was opened with the graduation ceremony of the Camden High School, class of 1931. National significance is based on several points. One, the Camden Amphitheater and library grounds represent the creative genius of Fletcher Steele. Two, it is an enduring example of an open air theater. Three, it is associated with the nationwide movement for country planning and village improvement. It demonstrates the effort made in the early 20th century by landscape architects and private patrons to develop public landscapes. Scholars recognize it as a tangible representation of Steele's early experimentation with modernism. Today, the amphitheater accommodates a full range of public events, many of them musical, dramatic, and artistic. It is also a popular venue for weddings, which number 20 to 30 every year. Note the original chairs from 1931 remain in good condition and are still in use today. Even when choices are limited in where and how often we venture out during this time of COVID-19, the relative safety of the amphitheater and Harbor Park continue to be a well-loved source of beauty and refuge for our community. Dave Jackson and the Camden Public Library invite the community to help keep the parks thriving by making a donation at librarycamden.org slash donate. Your gift will help our parks remain just as we know them to be, historically authentic, lovely, and forever welcoming.